welcome. I am sitting with uh, Gary Lachance, the uh, co-founder and spiritual advisor to Tom and Gary's Decentralized Dance Party. Hi. It's been uh, the Decentralized Dance Party of which we are all involved and uh, these uh, sunglasses are somewhat symbolic. Uh, has been linking decentralization to uh, cultural embodied togetherness in crazy dance parties, uh, capital P partying, for uh, almost eight years now. And on my right is Alex Sterk, uh, the host of the long-running uh, Bitcoin uh, and now blockchain in general podcast, Block Talk, and uh, the COO of Ubic. And uh, we're all uh, very dedicated members of the Vancouver decentralization community. Now, I am going to just straight patch in a short clip from the Institute for the Future, explaining the structural possibilities of uh, blockchain technologies beyond just fintech um, in about two minutes. Because I think it's the best, and I think we shouldn't reinvent the wheel when trying to, you know, put down the building blocks of these things. So that is going to happen now. When you vote, have you ever wondered whether your ballot is actually counted? If you meet someone online, how do you know they're who they say they are? When you buy coffee that's labeled Fairtrade, what makes you so certain of its origin? To be sure, really sure, about any of those questions, you'd need a system where records could be stored, facts could be verified by anyone, and security is guaranteed. That way, no one could cheat the system by editing records, because everyone using the system would be watching. Systems like this are on the horizon, and the software that powers them is called a blockchain. Blockchains store information across a network of personal computers, making them not just decentralized, but distributed. This means no central company or person owns the system, yet everyone can use it and help run it. This is important because it means it's difficult for any one person to take down the network or corrupt it. The people who run the system use their computer to hold bundles of records submitted by others, known as blocks, in a chronological chain. The blockchain uses a form of math called cryptography to ensure that records can't be counterfeited or changed by anyone else. You've probably heard of the blockchain's first killer app, a form of digital cash called Bitcoin that you can send to anyone, even a complete stranger. Bitcoin is different from credit cards, PayPal, or other ways to send money because there isn't a bank or financial middleman involved. Instead, people from all over the world help move the digital money by validating others' Bitcoin transactions with their personal computers, earning a small fee in the process. Bitcoin uses the blockchain by tracking records of ownership over this digital cash, so only one person can be the owner at a time and the cash can't be spent twice, like counterfeit money in the physical world can. But Bitcoin is just the beginning for blockchains. In the future, blockchains that manage and verify online data could enable us to launch companies that are entirely run by algorithms, making self-driving cars safer, help us protect our online identities, and even track the billions of devices on the Internet of Things. These innovations will change our lives forever, and it's all just beginning. To learn more about the urgent future of the blockchain, please visit iftf.org slash blockchain futures lab. Institute for the Future does a really good intro layer on uh, blockchain as it would affect all sorts of parts of uh, human society, governance, law, uh, and the long, you know, the first use case, finance. Um, Alex Sterk has, uh, as I said earlier, been very, very uh, deeply involved with the Bitcoin side of things. And really, I feel you've been an original educator for many through running Block Talk. So uh, Bitcoin as the first, the first run of a blockchain protocol, uh, the, uh, the <laughs> darling of the blockchain scene. Uh, would you explain why Bitcoin uh, is like disruptive? Um, I think it's very disruptive in the fact that it's like, uh, uh, it's this underlying community that's been able to now be uh, incentivized and trust each other um, uh, and have like an actual currency that isn't reliant on anything outside of their community. And uh, maybe at the start it was uh, libertarians or cryptographers, but now like it's expanded to um, really include a, a large portion of, uh, you know, the spectrum of people. Uh, and, and now we, we see um, a lot of more utilization of uh, this network. But uh, 
it being that it's a utility, it is available for all of us. It's kind of like uh, the next generation of uh, uh, you know the power grid. Anyone can plug into it and do uh, use it for uh, the benefit of the world. And uh, yeah, I think uh, the 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 future looks bright for it as being the first mover and also having uh, no kind of centralized authority. Um, which will help it really kind of uh, blossom without having any government inter intervention. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's I think the uh, the the key of decentralization as a larger concept outside of Bitcoin. But the thing that Bitcoin did so radically well is um, to, to basically move from the need to go through a chain of command in a rigid uh, hierarchical power structure to determine things like the, you know, like the uh, provenance of data, to uh, verify that, uh, that transactions are, you know, are legitimate, um, and moving that into the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, sort of structure that we see, the peer-to-peer -peer does make sense to any modern technology users because it's what file sharing and stuff like that was based on. And in fact, the internet itself, we all are constantly supplying information uh, amongst ourselves. And uh, Bitcoin just happened to be, I, I feel like Bitcoin worked so well because it had the one use you know, like it, it was focused on the fintech side. It was here is the perfect peer-to-peer -peer decentralized currency. But that has led to, it, it's a really narrow focus there, has also led to somewhat of suspicion towards blockchain by, uh, you know, people who are in more or anarchic frameworks and stuff like that. They're like, oh, well, isn't that that replication of capitalist models <laughs> and isn't it a little pyramid schemey and stuff like that so um the the fact that bitcoin has done so well at um just kind of disrupting mainstream financial markets i think uh has drawn the uh, at least for me initially it drew the eye into the coin part and it made me very suspicious but um, decentralization, uh, decentralization and governance, decentralization and um, community building, there have been pretty complex dances in that area. And I, I mean, a lot of that traces back to another parallel track in tech, the open source movement. Uh, decentralization is pretty much uh, inextricable from open source production of new knowledge and technology where we share, we put our time in and uh, make sure that anyone can fork your code, so to speak. I feel like that's a very big part of maker movements, decentralization, and at its core, you know, like the, the blockchain dev sort of world. So you're a long-standing, uh, free and open source-minded uh, gentleman. And that's where the roots mm -hmm. of the DDP lie as well. So I'm gonna talk about your, your passion for decentralization. I guess it started well, I got introduced to the idea when the Wikipedia was first blossoming in the early 2000s and researched it more and more and one day, I think it was summer of 2011, I had this crazy eureka moment where I realized the whole world could potentially become open source. and. That was kind of the driver behind developing the DDP as an open and decentralized movement that anyone could join and opt into and participate in. And then when Bitcoin came on the scene, I first saw it in 2011, and it was just this crazy moment where the final piece of the puzzle was there. And yeah, since then I've been trying to learn and figure out how the whole world can indeed become decentralized and what I can do to evangelize that and help make it happen. And it's been a lot of fun. Wouldn't you say? I would say. I've only joined up with uh, the Decentralized Dance Party in the past uh year or so, and I mean, Sterk, you were around Vancouver, you were in the Vancouver scene before me, were you uh, affiliated 
Have uh, you been to any DDPs before? I knew of uh, Gary very well. Back okay, then. many do, many yes. do. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it, it, what comes to mind, and particularly in terms of uh, you know the, a lot of the genesis of brainstorming and collaborating going on in 2017 with decentralization. There is this amazing overlap with um, the sort of the intentional living communities and Burning Man type crowds and stuff. We are actually all going to be uh, helping uh, Griff Green to uh, build and, and flourish Camp Decentral at Burning Man this year, where there will be talks on these super, we think, revolutionary issues, decentralization, technology, and changing the future of humanity. Um, all daytime, I think, right? We've got, we're gonna have a schedule. It's basically decentralization soapbox. And it's been really inspiring to see how many people that are into it just what an overlap there is between people who are tr who are focused on human well-being and shared community and people who are getting excited about disruptive technology um and a uh, bit of a chicken and the egg there <laughs> i think it's just i think it's impossible to not start thinking deeply about the shared human experience when you're mucking about with uh, wild technological revolutions, uh, because uh, there a, a lot of a lot of the things that we've seen in this short period of time, in the past, just that I've been involved with blockchain, um, shifts in governance that are uh, enabled by the possibility to say have a cryptocurrency like Ether on the Ethereum blockchain be split. And I, I don't think we'll have time to go into that. I want to patch in a link at the end for you to check out the uh, the DAO hack last year and the split of Ether into Ether and Ether Classic. So when we're talking about governance, when we're talking about community building, um, looking at how we could potentially have autonomous communities coexisting, not really, uh, not really interrupting one one another's ability to carry on as they wish. It's, it's just really interesting. There's, in most of even the private sphere, like the private sector in the blockchain community, I don't see much competition between projects and companies. I see collaboration, people high-fiving and saying, you're working on that aspect of this? Cool, we're working on this. And either we can provide structures that help each other's projects thrive, or we just accept that users will choose what they want and both could likely, you know, you, you could have enough users adopting one interface for decentralized control of your data, for example, and others choosing a different one. So these technologies give us a degree of freedom that we really haven't seen the, uh, the technical concrete infrastructure for yet, I think, in history. So I don't know, is there any, like, Quick comment on the stuff you've seen in blockchain, DDP, Vancouver decontrol, or anything like that related to disruptiveness, Stirk? A lot of opt-in um, stuff going on, like with the uh, with the blockchain. Like in order to upgrade it, um, you can either do like a soft fork of trying to keep everyone on, you know, not forcing them all to have to upgrade. But you can also do uh, hard forks where it's like here we all as a community need to decide to make this change that's better so it's uh the governance that forms around that and, and uh just that overall choice of uh having to opt into new systems um it, it is uh really powerful yeah Gary? yeah i guess in line what you said <clears throat> i'm pretty excited about the potential for autonomous decentralized communities where it could use 3D printing technology to print houses in concrete. You could print the electricity circuit boards right into them. You could have solar panels on the roof powering it all and you could use that power. A new LED growth light technology to grow vegetables, power aquaponics. So you could have your food and shelter and heat and air conditioning and figure out a way to have internet. You could have that taken care of. You could set up a whole 3D print a whole city or a small village with you and your friends on a piece of land that was very cheap that nobody cared about. And, or ideally, start your own country and 
experiment with your own governance and then we can opt into whatever community we want to live in and I think that'll be far superior to what we current see, currently see which is termed as democracy which is basically the original 51% attack tyranny of majority everyone spending all their time and energy fighting and trying to impose their ideas and values on the other side and very soon there will be a better way a way of pluralities where pluralities can coexist is, is what I see in decentralization and uh, I guess I would close out for the specific uh, you know for the specific crowd this is intended to uh, to go to in Hollyhock um, I think what w the decentralization movement could really use is experience around we're in that that uh, germinal stage where we're trying to make sure that money goes to projects without corruption entering the picture and I think that takes a lot of wisdom from people who have navigated you know the formation of social good uh, organizations and stuff like that like we I feel like all of history is this this tense uh, but uh, determined little dance between uh, you know living in reality within structures of funding and stuff like that and maintaining the innovative edge that um, that comes from lean functioning and comes from being driven by ideals rather than profit margins. So, so much of blockchain arose from and still thrives mostly within fintech, but for starting to utilize decentralized, uh, decentralized tools in relation to governance um, and uh, to create, you know, pr protective structures to uh, make the world a better place, there's definitely this this uh, tango right now of is this for the people? Is this for token value within a structure? So I think having interested parties who are experienced at um, protecting <laughs> protecting uh, vision in things as those things are implemented in the real everyday world where bureaucracy is a necessity. Like we need to maintain uh, maintain the beauty uh, and the uh, you know moonshot element of decentralization while making sure that it can affect real societal structures um, and it's yeah it's I, I'm going to share some more links to educational videos and um, you can reach me actually directly if you want if you see this and you want to talk to us if you want to talk about this anything um, you can reach me at innovative period disruption at gmail.com and yes, I use Gmail. I'm sorry my free and open source community <laughs> um, Thank you. Yeah, yeah again, it's and that's actually what blockchain is about to face too is the we do things that are convenient so we can survive our busy days like I use Gmail because it has interoperability so that's the next step of the technical side of the revolution is making these tools accessible for wide adoption. But anyhow, the video is getting long. Thank you both for, uh, for joining me in this and uh, viva la blockchain revolution. Yes, viva.